Real women don't love you, but your waifu will stick around long enough to make a profit. On the rising of the shield hero and the corporatization of otaku culture. Hello and welcome to Most Home for Fetuses and Hot Takes. History in the making. Well, history for me, personally. Probably, probably not history for you, as this is the first time that we're doing an audio recording of a treatise here. We'll see how it works out. If you guys find it useful, let me know. Otherwise, we've got a lot to cover. Um, lots of capitalism, lots of existential dread, and of course, everyone's favorite raccoon slave girl, Raftalia. So without further ado, let's get into it. The Rising of the Shield Heroes Raftalia is the perfect waifu. Real girls don't accept me for who I am. Real girls think I'm awkward. Real girls think I'm shy. Real girls won't give me a chance. And even if one did, it wouldn't take long for her to make me miserable. You do everything you can to please her, and in the end, it's not good enough. It's never good enough. I was never good enough for her, and I will never be good enough for them. Real girls are hard to understand. Real girls sleep with other men. How am I supposed to compete with that? Real girls will leave me the second they don't have to settle for me anymore. Real girls lie. Real girls steal. Real girls cheat. Real girls have desires of their own that I will never fully understand. Not like Raftalia. Raftalia understands me even when the whole world is against me. Raftalia loves me for who I am. Raftalia stands up for me even when I don't want to. Raftalia defends me against a society that wants nothing more than to see me suffer. Raftalia is cute. Raftalia is a virgin. Raftalia is the perfect waifu. Raftalia is perfect. 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 Everything that I'm about to get into can get pretty upsetting at times. Specifically, we'll be talking about slavery, especially involving children, blood and gore, abuse in all forms, sexual harassment and assault, sexual assault allegations, sexism, and harsh sexist language, racism, suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, and, of course, just awful writing all around. So, if any of these bother you, I would click out now. We're also going to be spoiling all of S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero, and not that it's a show worth spoiling, but if you wanted to experience the pain for yourself, I guess you can click out too. We'll be spoiling uh, another anime, Welcome to the NHK. So if you're planning on watching that and you don't want to be spoiled, you'll know when those spoilers are later in the in the essay, and you can avoid them if you'd like. This is Section 1. Part 0. Introduction. You know what's interesting? How often light novel and anime protagonists are otaku. We tell ourselves this makes sense. After all, light novel and anime are for, well, light novel and anime fans. So of course the main characters will reflect its audience in some way. Right? But not really. How many movie protagonists are diehard movie fans? How many American sitcom protagonists have memorized every line from every episode of Friends? How many JRPG protagonists own every major JRPG made after the 1986 release of Dragon Warrior for the NES? Yet, it's otaku media that's filled with otaku protagonists, saturated with them. And it's not random, either. An otaku show is usually, but not always, an isekai of the world type show that probably features a sprinkle of incest and a dash of lollicon. Or as normal people call it, pedophilia. So when you hear the word... Otaku, what exactly do you think of? If you're reading this, there's a good chance you identify as one. Otaku are shut-ins, sure. They have no friends or love lives, they love anime, manga, and light novels. These are all traits common in otaku, but, but they're not universal. The one thing that marks an otaku above all else is that they own a lot of stuff. They go out and 
buy the figurines and the original releases and the re-releases and the blu-rays and all the books and the ovas and the t-shirts and the body pillows and the costumes and on and on until their rooms look like you stepped into some bizarre ultimate dimension the more secluded you are from the outside world the more you withdraw from education and employment the more of your life is taken up by consuming artifacts of otaku culture the more of a real fan you are in otaku and weeb circles, there's a superficial acknowledgement that this type of behavior is probably unhealthy in some way, but sacrificing your physical and mental health for media consumption almost acts like a badge of fan honor. <clears throat> Looking at you, our anime IRL. Why is that the image most associated with otaku culture? Isn't that an odd defining trait for a community? Who benefits from this stereotype? And most importantly, where did it come from? Part 1. Raftalia and You, aka Shield Hero and Slavery Redux Despite my best, yet rather humble efforts, this show refuses to die in a fire where it belongs. <laughs> Shield Hero's first season was such an overwhelming success that it's been confirmed for two more seasons. It's been voted the best anime of the first half of 2019, and it's getting a spin-off called a, a spin-off called The Menu of the Wait, what is, what is this? The first episode has Naofumi using his skills as the shield hero to cook a hunted monster for Raptalia. However, can he really enjoy eating it when all he tastes is betrayal? L look, I I wish I was bullshitting you guys. But it's all true. It really is that fucking stupid. The dystopia is here, and it is brain dead. So I guess we're doing this. One last time. Alrighty then. The rising of the shield hero follows the adventures of neoliberal anime sad boy and professional shield bro, Naofumi Iwatini, and his adventures in a fantasy video game inspired alternate universe. Chances are, if you know about the show but haven't seen it, God, I envy you. You know it from the supposed SJW backlash it received when the first episode dropped back in January. If that's the case, I'd like to stop here and say hi. My name is Mo Black. I'm 20 years old. I'm bad with people and worse with relationships. At any given moment, I always hate myself just a little bit. My favorite color is blue, and this entire blog is a product of my undying hatred for the colossal mess that is the rising of the shield hero. Ugh. Are we still talking no. about this? No, okay, she was like, 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 Oh, great. So Here comes the outrage mob right on cue. It's alright. Get it out of your system. I'm here for you, buddy. I've already talked about Shield Hero, links in the description, where I've argued both that Shield Hero flames slavery as a positive, and it uses that framing to paint women who do not submit their autonomy to men in relationships as inherently dangerous or deceitful especially if the woman is young and or attractive. It's a lot of reading that I encourage you to look at on your own time. Still, since it's a lot of reading, like I said, and not all of it is useful for this treatise in particular, I'll be bringing out the key points from those essays in this one to look at them in a new meta-narrative context, one in which the viewer's experience of Raptalia as a waifu and the viewer's identification as an otaku is taken into account. If you already read these somehow, Great! Now that the first season is complete and the dubs are done too, we'll get to look at these arguments with new evidence. Despite the endless pain the show gives me, I'm actually pretty excited. So let's jump in. Now Fumi is one day transported to the kingdom of Belremark via Magic Light Novel. He learns that he is the legendary shield hero, summoned to protect the land from apocalyptic waves of monsters. He's summoned with the other three heroes the spear hero, the bow hero, and the sword hero. While the other three classes have offensive capabilities, Naofumi's shield is only good for defense, making it the weakest and most useless of the four. Nonetheless, he expects his adventure to play out just like any typical fantasy wish fulfillment light novel would, but things go south when the princess of the country, Malti Melremark, disguised as a woman named Mine, falsely accuses Naofumi of rape. Scorned by his country and unable to return to his own world, now Fumi realizes that without a party he can trust, he's too weak to survive the waves on his own, and he may rot in Melremark instead of returning home. He decides to buy a child slave from an underground dealer, Raftalia, 
to fill his ranks and fight the waves. When Raftali is bought, she's so young she still wets the bed. Online shield hero discourse amuses me greatly. Interestingly enough, the thing about the rising of the shield hero is that it's not exactly unpopular to criticize it. The show is atrociously paced, swapping character development for time lapses way too often. Aside from a couple of obvious money shots, the animation is lazy, and the 3D models look out of place. And, even with the concept of a protagonist owning a slave being darker than most isekai, it follows most of the tropes of the genre to a T. Criticism and difference of opinion around this show are not hard to find. That is, of course, until you bring up the content of the show itself. Many are willing to let Shield Hero languish in mediocrity up until the instant someone suggests that it's maybe kind of fucked up the show tries to pass a relationship between a master and his child slave as healthy. Suddenly, Shield Hero is a masterpiece that must be defended at all costs against the assault from the enemy SJW. Isn't that interesting? Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf is a rambling, repetitive mess of a document that barely made it through a single copy editor before being published. That being said, complaining about how poorly written Mein Kampf is without being open to criticizing the toxic, evil ideas espoused in the text would at best show some extremely backwards priorities and at worst reveal some troubling beliefs by the critic. And before you blow up at me, I'm not saying that the Rising of the Shield hero is just as bad as the foundational text behind one of the most evil regimes ever to grace the face of the planet. Instead, I'm arguing that the silent implication that valid anime criticism is apolitical criticism, as if such a thing can even exist, is nonsensical and arbitrary. It's an especially garbage implication given that anime fans have no problem, say, criticizing anime dub makers for writing progressive politics into shows. Criticism of the left from the right is somehow deemed apolitical and necessary to keep politics out of anime, but criticism of the right from the left is forcing a political agenda down my poor, soft, red, begging throat. <sighs> Wonder how that works. I'll stop playing dumb. I know exactly how that works. It's a disingenuous argument meant to silence disagreement. It creates an atmosphere that buries much-needed criticism of popular anime, even when said anime are hurting the community at large. In episode 4 of The Rising of the Shield Hero, the spear hero, Motoyasu Kitamura, frees Raftalia from Naofumi's bondage. While Naofumi argues that because Raftalia has been quote, helpful, unquote, to him, and that slavery is quote, legal in this crazy place, unquote, he's doing nothing wrong. Motoyasu believes that as heroes from a world where slavery is morally wrong, Naofumi shouldn't own other people under any circumstances. Naofumi says that Motoyasu is, quote, free to his opinion, unquote. After being freed, Raftalia is furious at Motoyasu. She argues that Naofumi never abused Raftalia, only forced her, by way of torture, to do things against her will when she was too scared to do so, which is, you know, the, the definition of abuse. She argues that Naofumi bought her when she was sick and starving, on the verge of death, she argues that Naofumi bought her food when she wanted and cured her illnesses. She argues that if Motoyasu was anywhere near as kind and moral as Naofumi is, he would have already bought his own slaves to take care of too. In an 1857 text entitled Cannibals All, or Slaves Without Masters, author George Fitzhugh argues in favor of the chattel slavery that existed in the American South at the time. In it, Fitzhugh labels the, quote, free labor, unquote, resulting from the North and Europe's transition to capitalism as, quote, the white slave trade, unquote. He writes, quote, The white slave trade is far more cruel than the black slave trade because it extracts more of its slaves and neither protects or governs them. While capitalists will garnish their workers' wages, quote, The slave master allows the slave to retain a greater share of the results of his own labor. He continues, arguing that the Negro slave is free, in mind as well as body, for the master provides food, raiment, house, fuel, and everything else necessary to the physical well-being of self and family. According to Fitzhugh, capitalists are slave owners without the obligations of a master. These obligations make the, quote, Negro slaves of the South the happiest and the freest people in the world. No wonder men should prefer white slavery to capital, to negro slavery, he argues. Since, quote, 
It is more profitable and is free from all the cares and labors of black slaveholding, unquote. Raptalia's arguments read exactly like 18th century anti-abolitionist rhetoric. The idea that actual chattel slavery is a moral good because the slaves get fed and they're happy that way is not some clever writing twist on behalf of Shield Hero's staff, but a really old and well-trodden historical argument. Not that capitalism isn't bad or doesn't exploit workers, it's just that capitalism being bad doesn't justify slavery. Not even close. I mean, come on, Fitzhugh. The fact that in episode 5, Raptalia chooses heavy scare quotes to become a slave doesn't help things. It echoes the same anti-abolitionist rhetoric that black Americans who knew what was good for them would choose slavery over freedom every time. They, like Raptalia, lived in a world that would eat them alive. Anti-abolitionists, like Shield Hero, see slavery as slave masters generously sacrificing their time and money to protect their slaves. Just yikes. Enslaving yourself as a symbol of trust my ass. Surely a relationship where both people are free autonomous beings who trust each other to act on their own is a far better symbol of trust than this vomit-inducing arborist of pain. And if she feels compelled to do it to satiate now Fumi's misogyny-driven trust issues, that's just a sign of a shitty relationship. Let me say this again. Now Fumi could have clothed, fed, and been kind to Raptalia without owning her as a slave. None of the things Raptalia supposedly praises now Fumi for are in any way, shape, or form contingent on supporting the institution of slavery. Let it be known that having trauma and trust issues is in fact not a valid reason to deny women's personal autonomy and call it a relationship heavy scare quotes. Please and thank you. The buying and selling of human beings such that they exist in a state with no legal rights or autonomy is wrong, period. There are no ifs, ands, or buts here. The fact that the show would set up Motoyasu as a mouthpiece for what should be a universal truth, just to knock him down with a page writ from one of the leading texts in defense of slavery, is more than wrong, it's backwards and upsetting. Slavery is wrong in all scenarios, and the fact that the show tries to create a false situation in which slavery is somehow justified is beyond disgusting. I, I'm not exactly sure how I'm expected not to get quote offended unquote when this anime is being blatantly offensive, and I'm not sure how I'm supposed to say nothing when I see a community giving credibility to these outdated, bigoted arguments in service of owning the SJWs. Shield Hero's fourth episode is so rabid in its defense of slavery that the team for the English dub actually went and changed some of the key lines of dialogue to make Raptalia and Naofumi's relationship easier to swallow in the West. For example, Raptalia tells Moriyasu, if that were true, you would have a slave by your side too, in the sub version. However, in the dub version, that same line at that exact moment is rendered as, if that were true, you would have someone loyal by your side too, instead of that two-faced princess. They change Raptalia openly advocating for slavery as a moral good to make it seem like she's criticizing Moriyasu's choice to trust the woman who wrongly accused Naofumi of rape. This makes no sense because she still challenges Moriyasu's morality as compared to Naofumi's, citing Naofumi feeding her and giving her medicine as proof of his moral character, like we talked about earlier. <laughs> also, calling a slave someone loyal. Nice try on the euphemism, I guess. Later that same episode, Naofumi says, I saw you as nothing but a tool at first, too. To which Raftalia replies, But you saved me. In the subversion. However, the dub version is, You see, you were nothing but a tool for me to use for my own advantage. To which Raptalia responds, I know, but it doesn't matter because you still rescued me. The dub makes Raptalia acknowledge that, as a slave, she's being used as a tool for Naofumi's personal gain. Her conclusion is that this doesn't matter for... for some reason. But they try it, I guess. In the subversion... Modiasu still isn't convinced. He says, Raptalia Chen might still be doing all this because she's brainwashed. To which the bow hero responds, It's amazing that you can say that after seeing them like this. In the dub version, Modiasu says, Or maybe Raptalia is only doing this because she's been brainwashed. To which the bow hero responds, Just look at them. It's not like a master and slave relationship. It's different. Perhaps brainwashing isn't the right word? 
But Modiasu is absolutely right that the power dynamics at play here make it impossible for Raptalia to consent to the condition she's in. It's like saying pedophilia is okay because the child wants it. The child wouldn't be in a position to make an informed decision as to what's going on. Let's say this again. If the only reason Raptalia consents to slavery is because her survival depends on it, that's not real consent. The dub also has the bow hero, Itsuki Kawasumi, outright state that Naofumi and Raptalia's relationship isn't like a master-slave relationship, which makes it especially a weird choice, given that the dub also opts to translate Raptalia's Naofumi-sama as Master Naofumi, forever codifying the master-slave relationship they try to deny exists into every single scene Raptalia opens her mouth. Like I said, they tried. They didn't have a lot to work with, after all. She's skinny and shaking in fear. Even if she is a demi-human, her face is good enough, just like a normal person. I can imagine that I've made that woman into my slave. I've made up my mind. I'll take her. That's... that's from the manga. Little known fact, as awful as this show is, the source material is infinitely worse. Please don't give it your time. Also, just because the writers say Raftalio is never abused doesn't make it true. You ever just insult so hard you justify slavery already covers why Nakumi's treatment of Raftalio's abuse. Section 2 out of 3 goes into detail about the cycle of abuse and how Shield Hero tends to pretend that abusers get nicer, heavy scare quotes, if the victim is perfectly compliant and infinitely patient. It hurts to watch. Like I said, read it on your own time. You only hurt yourself by refusing. So says Naofumi of Raftalia in the show's second episode. This kind of stuff is generally the kind of thing abusive fuckwads say, but I guess if you're an anime protagonist, that works too. Raftalia is a child, not a soldier. She needs therapy, not the opportunity to prove her worth in the salt mines in exchange for having her basic needs met, masquerading as kindness. She needs to learn how to be her own person after years of being owned by other people, not the privilege of being chosen as Naofumi's sword. Are you guys? Are you guys getting what I do to scare quotes? Anyway. People have use outside of their strict utilitarian use, you know? Shield Hero makes Raftali a child for a reason. It's constantly reminding you that Raptalia isn't quite grown up, from her being a virgin to believing that kissing causes babies, to the way she speaks and acts. The show desperately wants to endow Raptalia with all the coveted traits of a child. Yet, Shield Hero needs her to be an adult to consent to being in slavery. Such a thing does not exist. See again, you ever just insult so hard you justify slavery and needs her to be an adult when the audience inevitably sexualizes her. She's, perhaps, a child in an adult's body? So, I'm mentally a child, but physically I'm mostly an adult, says Raptalia from the Shield Hero manga right on cue. Thanks, Shield Hero. Very cool. In a text published in 1850 entitled, Universal Law of Slavery, George motherfucking Fitzhugh, wrote that, The Negro is but a grown-up child, and must be governed as a child, not a lunatic or a criminal. The master occupies towards him the place of a parent or guardian. Hey, do we have a clip of Naofumi maybe referring to his slave as his daughter? Just, you know, by any chance. Then are you my father or something else? No, I'm your owner. I see. Then what about Raftalia? She's kind of like my daughter. I am not! <laughs> I'm sorry, at this point I just love being right all of the time. Raftalia is a demi-human, meaning, among other things, her body ages with her in-game level, not the amount of time she's been alive. Conveniently, for Naofumi and the audience, Raftalia's level pushes past level 40, while her body doesn't look an XP point over level 21. In the first month after Naofumi recruits her for his party, she gains the body of a young adult, but her life experience remains underage from the frail child that used to wet her bed and cry about it. 
Raftalia is but a grown-up child, and now Fumi governs her as a child. These are the precise reasons that make Raftalia so popular and beloved. Her willingness to enslave herself makes her loyal. Her child's mind makes her cute and innocent. Her lack of a personal identity beyond serving her master makes her trustworthy and caring. In episode 10, now Fumi realizes he has the option to perform a class upgrade on Raftalia and his other slave, Philo. Why? Why more than one? <sighs> Raftalia says she'll upgrade her class to whatever now Fumi picks out, but now Fumi disagrees. He says once the four heroes defeat the last of the waves, now Fumi will be going back home, and Raftalia will need the skills to survive on her own. The idea of now Fumi leaving her gives Raftalia major anxiety. Because of course it does! She's not in the position to conceptualize her existence in the absence of Naofumi. The very last scene of the season, in episode 25, Naofumi cashes in a reward he's owed by the queen and rightful ruler Melramark for saving the country. He decides he wants to own the district Raftalia grew up in and was enslaved in. You know, I would have thought that if the show was as interested in Raftalia's well-being as the fans claim, and if the show was as against slavery as it pretends to be at times, Naofumi would have taken this time to ask the queen to end the practice. But no, he just owns more people, just as a landlord this time. Naofumi goes on and on about how he needs a new base of operations, and how all of Raftalia's childhood friends are here, and how she and Philo and this other girl Melty, somehow not a slave yet at this point, will live on. As lord of this land, Naofumi promises to turn a place that was once a pillaging ground for slave owners to a place where he's the only one that owns slaves, I guess, but now it's good now. I just want to embed what Raftalia says to Naofumi in this scene. I'm using the dub version because it's important to both understand the words coming out of this character's mouth and the untempered distress in her voice. At this rate, the rebuild will be finished in no time. Why here? I chose this place a long time ago. Your village was once destroyed by a wave, but now it'll be a symbol of resistance against them. Rishia won't be the last person we recruit. We'll train them all here and build an army bigger than the rest of the heroes have combined. That way, if something... Uh, Raftalia... Master Nalfumi, please, I can't. It's too much. It feels like, like you're trying to prepare us for when you're not going to be around anymore. It doesn't matter if Glass Lark and Therese show up again. We can beat them. We can beat the waves. I know it. You're not going to die, Master Nalfumi. I won't let you. Raftalia. But that doesn't really matter. Because once we beat all the waves, you're just going to go back to your world. And I'll never see you again. I never want that day to come. Yeah, well. Never. I won't accept it. Just imagining a life without you, it's absolutely unbearable. Yes, I, I just don't want you to go. Please, Master Nofumi, please stay. Even after the waves are gone, stay with us forever. <sighs> she begs and sobs and clings, literally and figuratively, to Nofumi. We're treated to a brief flashback, where we're reminded Raptalia is fundamentally that same kid from episode 2, who was so scared of being alone, the thought of being owned and treated like property by another person felt to her like an improvement. There's a scene in episode 20 that absolutely killed me. Episode 20 is like the plot climax of the show, because they ordered 25 episodes, but there's only 20 of actual content, and the 21st is just calling Malti a bitch. We'll get to that later. Um, but anyway, Raftalia, there's a flashback, and Raftalia is all like, In the beginning, I was terrified. I thought you were going to treat me like an object, like everyone else always did. But instead, you were nice to me. And like, on the screen, on the screen, we're showed a picture of like, Naofumi using this show's like, weird torture logic to like, torture Raftalia because she didn't want to stab a bunny that one time. Remember that? That was also episode two. So I was like, the abuse is on screen. Like, if you're going to, like, whitewash what actually happened in your own show, at least use the clips that are charitable to the point that you're trying to make. 
Like, <laughs> it's too easy at this point. It's it's, it, it, it's too easy. I, I, I need to write about something. I mean, God. There is a stark difference between missing a loved one, especially one that you may have to part with forever, and emotionally depending on someone to create a sense of meaning for yourself. From the first episode, now Fumi conditions Raptalia to associate her servitude with her sense of self because it makes her an effective child soldier to turn a prophet. At the end of episode 4, now Fumi admits as such, and Raptalia agrees. The show, however, argues that the benefits of now Fumi's selfishness trickle down to Raptalia. We're supposed to feel good that she's been exploited, manipulated, and abused because in the end, we're told that it's this exploitation, manipulation, and abuse that generated good for now for me, the world, and Raftalia herself. In the real world, good isn't a side effect of abuse. And this need to live through the validation of another person is unhealthy and unsustainable. But in the wonderful world of waifu space, this is just evidence that Raftalia loves now for me so much she doesn't want to see him go. <laughs> <laughs> Raftalia loves Naofumi in a way that woman in healthy relationships should never love you. Raftalia loves Naofumi because Raftalia understands she belongs to him. Raftalia loves Naofumi because she needs to love him to secure her physical safety, emotional stability, basic needs, and sense of self. Raftalia loves Naofumi because she is literally too young to process the nature of her relationship. Raftalia loves Naofumi in a way Naofumi can control entirely. Raftalia is loved because she represents a common but toxic relationship fantasy among fans. Raftalia shouldn't be normal. Raftalia is made to love her victimhood. And we're made to love her for it. This is the end of section one. Section two. Customer obsession versus otaku. Part 2. Follow the Money, aka How Corporations Synthesized Otaku Culture Customer obsession is a term invented by literal richest man on earth, Jeff Bezos, popularized by the success of his property, Amazon. It's kind of an ornery, sort of dystopian term, but since Amazon is the most valuable organization on the planet, and Jeff Bezos owns more of the world's resources than entire countries, I guess I'm obligated to take it seriously. I hate this. The interesting thing about the phrase customer obsession is that it's only used internally. When Jeff Bezos speaks to the media, he'll describe it as something like, The number one thing that has made Amazon successful by far is obsessive compulsive focus on the customer as opposed to obsession over the competitor. But internally, it's a different story. Corporate speak is a kind of a funny topsy-turvy world, in which words stop meaning things if they don't directly feed into the company's ceaseless drive to accumulate more wealth. At Amazon, it's not unionization, it's signs of employee disengagement. It's not underpaid, overworked employees, it's associates. And it's not cultivating a market for what you want to sell through a rigorous and expensive ad campaign that exploits the fact that you can just literally buy everyone's personal data from Facebook and Google. <gasps> it's Customer obsession. We are not anti-union, but we are not neutral either. We do not believe unions are in the best interest of our customers, our shareholders, or most importantly, our associates. Our business model is built upon speed, innovation, and customer obsession. Things that are generally not associated with unions. Customer obsession is presented as focusing on making a good experience for the customer instead of competing with other companies in your field. It's presented as putting the customer first. But that's only half the truth. As Daddy Bezos himself puts it, there are many advantages to a customer-centric approach. But here's the big one. Customers are always beautifully, wonderfully dissatisfied, even when they report being happy and business is great. Even when they don't yet know it, customers want something better and your desire to delight customers will drive them to invent on their behalf. No customer ever asked Amazon to create a Prime membership program, but it sure turns out they wanted it, and I could give many such examples. The practical effects of this business trend are to create markets where markets might not exist, or markets might not need to exist. 
it leads to wonderful mentalities like the following. Data is changing and transforming every industry you can think of, from education, where we can now better measure customer, I mean, student performance and teacher performance. In education, we're seeing data change dramatically the way people buy education and how teachers serve their customers, students and parents. Fatima Khatibu, Vice President, Principal Analyst at Forrester. To a normal, feeling human being, education is a field in which we inspire the next generation to learn grow, create, and fulfill their potential. Education is personal, where something that works for one student may not be successful for another. The goal of an educator is therefore to adapt to the needs of the children as they come. Education is for sale, only in the sense that under capitalism, teachers need money to, you know, live. But to the customer-obsessed capitalist, education is a market where data can be used to cultivate large, broad classroom profiles such that the products, i.e. basic educational services, can exist in the maximum number of classrooms possible. The wording of the phrase is deliberate. If you dig into customer obsession, you'll find that its proponents will often argue that it's not enough to simply believe the customer always comes first or that the customer is always right. To be successful, they argue, it requires a company to internalize a single-minded occupation with tracking customers' every move and thought, continually coming up with more and more stuff to sell them. Customer obsession does not content itself with a single successful sale. It does not rest until it molds the identities of large swaths of the population such that a company's products may be sold for larger and larger and larger profits. Customer-obsessed capitalism does not concern itself with people, only customers and markets that the capitalist is responsible for growing. Customer obsession means companies don't stop trying until you are obsessed too, until your identity revolves around the corporation as much as their identity revolves around the spreadsheets and numbers and sales charts that they make represent you. In the language of the wonderful Peter Coffin, Customer obsession would fall under the umbrella of cultivated identity. Customer obsession doesn't end with corporations. Just look at the state of modern politics. Rather than having politicians who reflect the views of the people, we have people being encouraged to reflect the views of their politicians. It doesn't matter what you believe, it matters who you support. In Japanese, the word otaku is derived from an expression referring to another person's home. The term became used as an honorific second-person pronoun. In the 1980s, humorous and essayist Akio Nakamori used it ironically, attaching the word to a caricature of obsessed, shut-in, socially awkward anime and manga fans. The idea was, these fans were so socially kneecapped and so detached from society at large that they go around using a very high-status honorific on random people. Between August 1988 and June 1989, a man named Sumoto Miyazaki went on a spree of violence, doing things that you really shouldn't trouble your conscience by googling. It... it was bad, yeah. The media latched onto Sumoto's large collection of anime and horror films as the reason for his crimes, granting him the name The Otaku Killer. Today, People call themselves otaku. Like, no sweat, it's not a big deal. Yeah, I'm an otaku, you're an otaku, everyone's an otaku. So, how'd that happen? How did, in the span of only three decades, the term otaku go from stigma and mockery to a mark of pride? Well, the classical explanation goes a little like this. Classes in Japanese schools are stratified in a caste-like structure, with clubs being the exception to this social hierarchy. As unattractive and unathletic men were deemed social failures, they turned to their studies in hopes of making enough money in the future to become rich enough to earn a spouse. At the bottom of their social hierarchy at school, it was in these clubs where they cultivated an interest in anime and manga. Beginning in the late 80s and early 90s, many such fans began to refer to themselves as otaku. But see, this explanation is unsatisfying, to say the least. I mean, it's not entirely wrong, it just ignores one key fact. During this time, the Japanese animation industry also happened to grow into the multi-billion dollar industry it is today, with executives pocketing enormous profits. All the while, 
Entry-level animators can make an equivalent of $2 per drawing, many working without pay at all, while working 400 to 600 hours a month with few to no days off. Keep in mind the 40-hour workweek standard in the United States is 160 hours a month. Keep in mind a sufficiently detailed keyframe for high-quality anime is hours of work per drawing. So animators are lucky to earn in a day what many in the United States earn per hour as minimum wage and struggle to survive anyway. Remember customer obsession? The earliest mention of the phrase I could find was from a 1997 blog post by Jeff Bezos, commenting on how he believes customer obsession has driven the young company's success and how it will drive a more successful 1998. But the practice of customer obsession is nothing but a natural outcome of capitalism. It's only been made more intense by the advent of technology and big data. The practice certainly predates Jeff Bezos. When animation studios, manga publishing houses, and toy companies saw a crisis of young men driving themselves into the ground with their studies and drowning themselves in anime and manga to compensate for their lack of social acceptance, they did nothing to rectify the problem. They didn't push out media that encouraged them to be more confident or take care of themselves. Instead, they saw a market, a market that generates billions of dollars in profit, perpetuating otaku culture on the backs of what is often slave labor. Anime fans didn't just start calling themselves otaku on their own. The media they consumed also called anime fans otaku. The first breakout use of the word in anime to refer to fans coming from the 1988 release of Gunbuster. Media created by people who stand to profit from the toxic hyper-consumerism inherent in otaku culture. Customer obsession may not be the word we use to describe this, but that's categorically what this is. Otaku went from a borderline slur to an identity, not because anime fans stood up to the liberal media and reclaimed their hobby for themselves, but because businessmen figured out it would be easier to market anime to customers if those customers had a single identity. Under capitalism, this is a natural process. If your goal is to make more money as an anime executive, monetizing otaku culture is the obvious choice to make, and those collective choices lead to the state of anime fandom we see today. Part 3. It's Profit Stupid, aka Shield Hero's Defense of the Worst of Capitalism. One of the most defining moments of my experience with the rising of the shield hero has nothing to do with slavery or the false rape accusation that launched the show into infamy. It instead has to do with how Naofumi sees profit, and how the show views unregulated capitalism as a whole. In episode 7, Naofumi is paid to deliver a huge order of pesticides to a poor village. As he gets there, he realizes that a massive parasitic plant had overtaken the town, growing on all the buildings and sapping life out of what little crops these people had. Now Fumi arrives and realizes that the parasite also causes disease, giving him a chance to sell his medicine too. The townspeople explained that they were experiencing famine, so when the spear hero came by with a magic fruit that grew crops indefinitely and instantly, they took it in hopes of not starving to death. The fruit, however, grew out of control in a matter of days. Now Fumi first blames the town people for being too hungry and desperate not to immediately somehow realize that the fruit wouldn't work. He then refuses to help them get rid of the parasite unless he receives a cash reward. Now Fumi upholds his end of the deal in exchange for literally all the capital left in the village. <laughs> he then uses his useless shield powers to make the parasite into a real fruit that actually does cure hunger. He tries to make the people he just gouged out of their life savings pay up for it, but of course they can't afford his prices because he literally took all their money. It's hard to convey how fucked that is. Now Fumi takes his fruit, presumably leading the village to starve. Rattalia explicitly mentions that they have more than they can possibly consume. Now Fumi says it's okay, because the wealthy merchants will buy it off of them at a good price, which eventually, of course, they do. It's such a bizarre turn of events that, in my first sparring match with this show, I mentioned it as a footnote to my main point. I just didn't know what to make of it. But if we look at how shield hero, capitalism, and otaku culture intersect, this scene suddenly fits into place. Because, see, when writing 
an obvious wish fulfillment isekai like this, where the main character is always right, and you got cute girls fawning over your attention, never mind that none of the girls are adults somehow. <clears throat> the writers are typically looking for it cheap and easy ways to make the protagonist look like a hero. So maybe there's this girl who's insecure about herself. She's ugly, that is to say, not at all ugly at all, conventionally speaking. So the protagonist kindly lets her know that actually her barely noticeable birthmark isn't even a big deal to him at all. His fetish saves lives. Sure, what, what a guy. Or maybe you have a villain who's just so evil. I mean, this guy kicks puppies, kills indiscriminately, and hates pineapple on pizza. Just a real jerk. So the hero looks like an angel by comparison for simply not being any one of those awful things. But Shield Hero doesn't do this stuff. The show actually makes Naofumi act like an unadulterated dick a lot of the time. And even that's not exactly strange. Writers who want an anti-hero are looking for morally gray moments to shove into the shows to prove how complex they are. Because apparently allowing people to starve to death for totally preventable reasons is morally gray. In its general ineptitude, Shield Hero manages to create a situation eerily reminiscent of the modern-day food crisis in developed countries, while firmly and proudly standing on the wrong side of it. In the United States, for example, Americans waste a pound of food per person per day, while 40 million people, 12 million of them children, live in food-insecure homes. Meanwhile, local governments literally make it illegal to feed the homeless and hungry as individuals. At a global level, rich countries produce as much food as the entirety of sub-Saharan Africa. Worldwide food waste is enough to feed the world's hungry multiple times over. The only reason we don't do it is because of profit. What's weird about Shield Hero is that the anime makes Naofumi's dickery known. It lets its characters call him out on it, and then takes the opportunity to try and convince us that his objectively dickish ways are somehow actually the good thing. And just so I'm being absolutely clear, yes, trying to gouge people out of things they need to survive in emergencies and blaming them for their own misery is an objectively dickish thing to do. In the United States, for example, where I live, we have enough high-quality medicine and healthcare to take care of everyone in the country, and yet we have people committing suicide over the fact that they're, they're not able to pay their healthcare bills. We have seniors working until they die just to afford insulin. We have people dying from drug overdoses. All the while, billionaires are getting rich off this behavior, and they're telling us plebeians to work harder and not expect anything in life to come for free. <laughs> a part of me wishes I picked a less political example for this one and stuck within the framing of the story, but the truth is politics and storytelling aren't different especially not in, a, in an example like this one. If Shield Hero can make a moral and economic argument in favor of trickle-down economics, I should, at the very least, be allowed to say that's bullshit. Because it is. You know, I don't know why we're at the point in society where it isn't inherently obvious that letting people fucking die for no reason is wrong, but apparently... In the episode right before this one, now Fumi meets a merchant who lets him in on this world's business class. On the road, he's stopped by a bunch of bandits. His slaves are easily able to overpower them. Now Fumi fears that, if he lets them go, they'll go around telling people that the shield hero threatened them. He calculates that such a rumor would be bad for his business as a traveling salesman. So he threatens to kill them. Now Fumi offers the bandits their lives in exchange for all of their money and personal possessions, which he then turns around to sell. Now, keep in mind, these are bandits who threaten to rape Raftalia. They're not sympathetic figures, unlike the starving villagers. If the show wanted to, it could just leave it at that and not bother justifying Naofumi's actions. These bandits probably hurt a lot of people, after all. Even the most flamboyant of SJW cucks, like myself, would have to admit it. But the show feels the need to justify Naofumi's actions anyway. Here's the conversation. Are we actually looting these bandits? But doesn't this make us just as evil as they are? I'm afraid I don't agree. They're offering up everything they have to purchase safe passage from our savior. He's simply treating their lives as merchandise. If I may say, Sir Hero's a shining example of the true traitor's spirit, something lacking in our youth today. Looks like intimidation. 
Hey, how about the two of you do a little less chatting and a little more working? And while we're on the subject, pal, how do you figure you're gonna compensate me for the pack of trouble you caused me on this trip? Uh, all right, look. I'm not saying Shield Hero is capitalist propaganda. I'm saying that if somebody wanted to write capitalist propaganda, it'd look exactly like Shield Hero. I mean, treating their lives as merchandise? That's gotta be the quote of the day. And what's like something lacking in our youth today? Like, like, like they it just, what the fuck? Like, what the actual pickled fuck? Are we not like Raftalia? Abused and broken down by corporate structures until we let them place our identities into their hands, exchanging a natural need for human connection and validation for a new identity, an identity made to turn a profit for our masters. We are to be thankful for the opportunity to finally be recognized as something so thankful that we easily overlook our own exploitation and the exploitation of others. So thankful that recognizing our position in the hierarchy puts our own sense of being at risk. Are we not like Raftalia? Part 4. Welcome to the NHK, aka the anime that wrote my damn essay. Spoilers for Welcome to the NHK ahead. This is, this, this is the part. You want to skip to part 6, section 3 to avoid all Welcome to the NHK stuff. So now I'm going to get really excited because we're talking about something that isn't Shield Hero. <laughs> My blood pressure is lowered for the first time this entire treatise. Happiness feels within reach. I'll never find true happiness, though. This unfortunately but an illusion wrapped in a mirage cloaked in a smokescreen mystery. Welcome to the NHK is a critically acclaimed psychological slice-of-life anime starring one Tatsuhiro Sato, a mid-twenties jobless college dropout with crippling social anxiety and possible schizophrenia, it's a long story, that keep him trapped in his room for weeks, sometimes months on end. In Japan, this kind of phenomenon has a name, Hikikomori. One day, he meets a high school senior college freshman girl, Misaki Nakahara, who claims to run a therapy program to help Hikikomori recover from their condition. The show revolves around these nightly therapy sessions, Sato's attempts to produce a video game with an old high school friend and otaku, Kairo Yamazaki, and his sustained belief that the reason why Sato's life has turned out so miserably is because of a mysterious organization known as the NHK, which we're told works through the media and with secret agents to produce hikikomori like Sato. The show is praised for its wonderful animation, solid characters, and great sense of dark humor. Anyway, in 1905, American author and journalist Upton Sinclair published The Jungle. The Jungle followed its main characters, a family of Eastern European immigrants trying to survive in Chicago. They immigrated to the United States under the pretext that the United States was a land of opportunity and freedom, but instead found themselves swamped in debt and beholden to con men and banks. The slaughterhouse, where the father works, offers deadly hours, unsafe working conditions, and awful pay. Over the course of the book, the family is slowly torn away. The grandfather dies working in a meat packing plant due to unsafe conditions. One of the children dies of food poisoning. The father is laid off after getting injured at the same factory. The family falls apart when it's revealed the mother has exchanged sex with her boss to keep her job and the family out of debt. The family is evicted from their home, and the father realizes there is no escape from the hell he's found himself in. The respite the father finds is when he stumbles upon a socialist rally, where he finds community and a new sense of purpose. The book is praised for its ability to place words in order on a page, and something about leading a number of gradual reforms in the food packaging industry or whatever. Towards the middle of Welcome to the NHK, Sato finds himself in more financial trouble than ever before. His father got laid off from his job unexpectedly and, despite his years in the industry, can't find another job. His family is running through their life savings to help Sato make ends meet, but they're forced to cut his allowance in half. Having dropped out of college and having crippling social anxiety, Sato is unable to find work. However, he hears he can make a ton of money by grinding on this popular MMORPG. When Sato starts playing, he quickly becomes addicted. He stops working on his video game with Yamazaki to instead live within the virtual world of 
of the MMORPG. He meets a girl through the game, Nia, and develops an attraction to her. As time goes on, making money through the game starts to mean less to him. He cares more and more about making Nia happy and receiving her validation in return. Sato figures that in real life, women think he's a loser and a hikikomori. But within the confines of the game, he's a level 31 magic knight with a spirit sword. Girls like Nia like him and accept him for who he is. Girls like Nia stand up for Sato even when he himself doesn't want to. Nia defends Sato from a society that wants nothing more than to see him suffer. He has no incentive to ever go back to the real world. That is, of course, until he learns the truth about Nia. One day, Nia claims she loves Sato so much she wants to visit him in person. Sato hasn't left the house in around a month. He hasn't bathed or shaved and his room's covered in garbage. He doesn't want Nia's first impression of him to be his current state, so he refuses. To his surprise, Nia claims she already knows where Sato lives and that she's just outside his apartment. The door opens, and it turns out it's none other than his friend, Yamazaki, who is pretending to be Nia to get him to stop playing video games and start making their own game. Yamazaki says, So-called romantic love can occur no matter who the other person is. That's right, even if that person is me. Sato, you should know by now that trying to attain something in a game is fruitless. The ones who make all the money are those who make the games and take advantage of people like you. Don't you get it? That's why we have to focus on finishing our gal game. When will you learn that a game isn't something you play, it's something you create? His love shattered, and realizing the game has put him further into his own financial hole, Sato goes into shock. He receives a mysterious call from a classmate he hasn't seen in years. Desperate to get away from his computer, he accepts to meet her. The woman, Megami Kobayashi, drags Sato out to the Japanese countryside, claiming she knows a very successful businessman who will help give Sato the tools and motivation he needs to snap out of his hikikomori state. When they arrive, Sato is quick to realize it's a pyramid scheme. When he tries to leave, Megami admits she's been trying to sucker him. She says that her father died after she graduated high school, passing on his debt onto her. Without having finished college, she couldn't get a decent job, so she used her body to land a series of degrading, sexualizing part-time jobs that all went out of business. The bosses pocketed the profits, while she was left with more and more debt. She took part in this pyramid scheme out of a desperation to pay her bills. Megami then says, Society wants a Kikamori like you to exist. It makes them secure. It gives them someone to look down on. Even if their lives are falling apart, they can always say, at least I'm better off than that guy. This world is dog-eat-dog. -dog. It's a zero-sum game. If you don't look down on others, then they're going to look down on you. If you don't want to suffer, your only choice is to make others suffer. Don't be a loser. Join the winning team. She also claims, Human relationships are based on nothing but lies. You'd be better off trading them for money. Rise in neoliberalism. It's this line of reasoning that wraps Sato up in her lies. He signs up for the pyramid scheme. Sato returns with Mizaki and Yamazaki to Megami to cancel his contract with the pyramid scheme. Megami at first agrees, but then sells him a pill that's supposed to cure his hikikomori condition for good. It's a diet supplement. Yeah, this show gives no fucks. As Sato puts it, I never guessed that all my problems could be solved with one simple product. Megami says, If all goes well, you won't just recover from your condition, you'll also become a wealthy businessman. It's the American dream. No, it's the Japanese dream. Sato and his friends track down Megami's address to give getting out of a pyramid scheme a second try. They corner her, so she has to. A thump and horrid growl can suddenly be heard from the ceiling. Megami claims she got a pet at the time her father passed away, and now she has to feed it, or it will get angry. She begs the three not to climb upstairs to see it, but of course they go anyway. The noises do not turn out to come from a feral animal, but from Megami's brother Yuichi, a hikikomori like Sato. Yuichi physically and verbally abuses his sister spending all his time gaming, saving breaks for the bathroom and to be fed by his sister. 
who barely had the means to survive as it is. Yuichi is stuck in the same loop Sato was, playing the same MMORPG for the slimmest chance of making a living off it. Yuichi even had met Sato in the game during a raid expedition. Like Sato, the prospect of making a living has long faded to the back of Yuichi's mind. Sato tries to explain how much pain Yuichi is causing his sister. He tries to get him to realize his behavior is self-destructive, and promises of making money in the game, like making money in a pyramid scheme, are so remote it might as well be a scam. Yuichi explains, The truth is, I already know what I should do. I know exactly what it takes to turn my life around. I don't need to hear it from you. Believe it or not, I've read over 200 self-improvement books. I even thought of writing one myself. I understand how it all works. I'm afraid. I don't know what will happen to my life after it changes. If I change my life, something unexpected might happen. It might change into something I can't control. I realize it's no good living like this, but I still can't bring myself to change. And suddenly, these seemingly separate plot threads become one. Random layoffs, an unattainable education, decent jobs locked away from those who need them most. When people do find jobs, they're jobs that steal and degrade and grind to dust. The show is replete with bosses that pocket profits off the backs of the workers they exploit and the consumers they make miserable. The socioeconomic pressures that push Sato to game are revealed to be the same that cause so much pain for everyone on screen. We realize there are no villains in the situation, not even Megami, just victims eating off each other to scrape by it, while a nameless, faceless few get rich off it all. A conspiracy, if you will, by the notorious NHK. Fans love this arc because it's the first time we see a full naked shot of a woman's fat oh, anime no titties cry. for the show's entire <laughs> runtime. Show oh, Why oh, the yeah, hell yeah, would they show it tits now? Kobayashi, love you. Upton Sinclair famously said about the reception of his book, I aimed at the nation's heart, but hit it in the stomach. Despite what I and many of you were taught in 7th grade history class, The Jungle was not a book Upton Sinclair wrote after discovering, as a journalist, how meatpacking in the Gilded Age was unsafe and gross. The Jungle is a full through critique of capitalism, how it ruins the lives of working people, and how, unless it is overthrown and replaced entirely, stories like those presented in the book will always exist. Despite what mal-reviews and any tube might tell you, the merits of Welcome to the NHK do not lie in the animation quality or the grim jokes or the almost love story between Sato and Misaki. The merits of the show lie through its deconstruction of exploitative practices of otaku media, its illumination of the many toxic, misogynistic, and self-destructive aspects of otaku culture, its criticism of capitalism and its role in corrupting human relationships for profit, and how all three of these self-perpetuate throughout society. It's not just a sensitive take on a Japanese cultural trend. Welcome to the NHK has radical implications for anime fans at any time, in any place. I'd be comfortable in saying Welcome to the NHK is one of the most important anime ever made in recent history. So let's talk about what it's really about, shall we? You've reached the end of section two. Thanks for sticking around. Convenience store relationships and a two liter bottle of misogynistic paranoia. Part 5, Naofumi Iwatini vs. The World, aka How Anime Builds Paranoia. How does Shield Hero make us feel? And by us, I of course mean the us in a general sense. It makes me specifically feel ill. At this point, the show has had concrete negative effects on my mental health. But what does the show seek to do for its audience? What frame of mind does the show want to put the viewer in while enjoying it? The answers to these questions become clear when we examine Shield Hero's female characters. Despite Shield Hero's rampant sexism, the majority of the show's female characters are either inoffensive or good people. In fact, the only aggressively awful character, the only caricature of a woman in the show, is Malti. 
This is probably the most common rebuttal I've gotten from the first time I covered this show. See, the show has plenty of strong women, so it can't possibly be sexist, said someone in my comment section who thinks they're way more clever than they actually are. Yes, it's a well-known fact that what makes a show sexist is how many female characters are multi. The more multi there are, as a proportion of the entire cast, the more SJWs burst into flames. Context? Framing? Screen time? Those don't exist. Nope. We gave Raftalia the full treatment already. Slave, conditioned to be dependent on Naofumi for a sense of self. Sexualized, largely deserves better given how much the show loves her. So we'll move on. Philo. As I argued in, you ever just insult so hard you justify slavery, Philo is just Raftalia, but more. What's better than nursing a sick child back to health? Literally raising her from birth. Philo is hatched from an egg of a monster known as Philolios. They're like bird horses, it's, it's unimportant. They sure are fluffy though. Anyway, Philo is special in that she can turn into a child too. As soon as Naofumi realizes that, he slaps a slave crest on her like he's handing out cheap cigars. If Raptalia is a child, Philo is even younger and even cuter than her. Like Raptalia, she's somehow interested in Naofumi sexually. And like Raptalia, she depends on Naofumi for her sense of self. In episode 20, Philo thanks Naofumi for giving him the carriage he forces her to pull for his party under the threat of torture and death. She says, Pretty much everything I love in this world, I got it from you. It's true, I guess. She knows nothing but Naofumi because Naofumi enslaved her from birth. Go back a few episodes and we have a clear idea of what exactly Firo is as a character. In episode 17, the Philolio Queen, we'll get to her, I promise, challenges Philo to a fight to test her strength. She asks Philo what she's fighting for, leading to the following exchange. Can you tell me what you are fighting for? I would have thought that was obvious. I'm fighting for my master! You couldn't beat the dragon last night, and you can't beat me now. How do you expect to be of any use to the shield hero? Uh, I won't lose to you! I'll become strong for master, and I'll beat you! Not with willpower as shallow as yours! <laughs> Philo is the only character who has anything resembling an arc in this show. Her flaw is that she rushes into fights without listening to Naofumi first. She grows by learning to truly internalize what it means to be Naofumi's property, like Raftalia already has. It's only when Philo listens to Naofumi's advice that she gains the upper hand in her fight against the Philolio Queen, and it's only when she sees every last bit of her decision-making to Naofumi that she unlocks her true potential as a fighter. The Philolio Queen, Fittoria is her name. Her stated character motivation is to make the heroes work together to stop the waves. That's part of the reason that she challenges Philo to a fight. If Philo were to lose, and Naofumi continued to refuse to set aside his differences with the bow, sword, and spear heroes, Fittoria would kill them all and force the summoning of new heroes that worked with each other instead of against each other. This, despite the fact that, in the first episode, we're told that if the four legendary weapons are used together, they become more unstable and less effective, and that competition between the four heroes was essential to their growth. This, despite the other fact that we're told that the four legendary heroes are supposed to be summoned to the four major countries on the continent, not just to Melrimark. If they were always meant to collaborate, how would that be if there's a two-week to one-month carriage ride between each country and thus each hero? Just a little reminder that this show fails mechanically as well as politically. The thing about Fatoria is that she doesn't actually care about all this. Other than a basic need to not die in the waves, she couldn't care less about the fate of the world or humanity. The real reason why she's doing it is that Vittoria was once owned by a hero, much like Philo is owned by Naofumi. The hero is long dead, but as his former slave, she's still carrying out his dying wish of making sure that the future heroes work together, even when, by now, she doesn't remember his name. She also wants to fuck Naofumi. Oh, come on! Malty and Melty Mellormark. God, this show is dumb fuck names.
Just in case you're confused, Malti is the eldest of the two sisters. She's second in line for the throne, but wants to be first. She plots to kill her other sister to get there. She frames Naofumi for rape and kidnapping and murder for no other reason that she can. In the subversion of the show, Naofumi lets us know he thinks she's slutty just from seeing her silhouette, and Malti's largely condemned for using her attractiveness to fool men. By that same token, the camera has no problem focusing on her body as she's slowly tortured for her crimes and lies with the slave crest by episode 21. She pays for her crimes of being a lying woman, and Shield Hero wants you to know that you're more than welcome to jack off to it. The Reddit comments for this episode were as disgusting as you might think, but completely prompted by the show. If you want to know more about it, check out Misogyny by Misdirection, Good Writing vs. The Curious Case of Princess Malty. Melty, on the other hand, is the good sister. I love her voice actress in the English dub, and I'm disappointed her talent was wasted on a show like this. Melty is Malty, but a child. She's responsible, diplomatic princess on the one hand, and she's cute kid on the other. She's trustworthy, loyal, inoffensive, and, as a child, needs Naofumi to make the best decision for her when the chips are down. Melty also wants to fuck Naofumi. Ah. Queen Melormark. When we finally see her face in episode 20, it's not after we get a few shots of her half-naked body. The Reddit comments for this episode were worse, and I won't bother screen capping them in the written version. She's a much better ruler than her husband. While she's an older woman, she's also oddly kid-like. She shares Malti's cute childlike obsession with Philolials and their fluffy burbness. So here's a funny story. I wanted to screen cap the two of them, like obsessing over Philolios for the written version, but like I couldn't find a good screen cap. And the reason why was because for this sequence, while the queen is going, oh, that Philolio you met was so wonderful. Like she's just kind of like groping her body the entire time. And the camera focuses on that and not actually communicating the idea <laughs> that Philo and like, the queen are like have this share this commonality right so like the show is so busy sexualizing its cast that the camera doesn't bother do its job and i think that's just hilarious anyway um when taken in full what we get from this smattering of colorful women is that there are types of women men can trust and form relationships with and there are types of women that ought to be avoided at all costs Children, for example, are too weak and innocent to disobey men. They can be capable and even useful to you, but they don't have the knowledge to challenge you in any real way or the wherewithal to betray you. Philo, Raptalia, and Melty fall in this category. The queen, while not a child, is given childlike qualities to signal to the audience that she's one of the good ones. Women that have some obligation to some other man can also be trusted. This largely includes mothers like Queen Melramark or older women who are either assumed to be married or too old for it to matter. The Philolio Queen also fits here because of her sworn duty to follow her male master's orders centuries after his death. Then we have free women. Women too young to have been married, too old to control, and at the right age to have real sexual power. These women are to be avoided at all costs. They are pathological liars. They will steal from you. They'll use their boobs as a distraction. Hiya! Women are inferior. He they manipulate us with their milkers. Cho, 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 cho. That's totally not your doing. Totally not a lack of self-control on your part. Or a lack of not being a dumbassness. It's definitely not temptress. Anyway, who knows? One of them might even accuse you of rape. Definitely not a statistically unfounded statement to make. Psst. It's actually a statistically unfounded statement to make, like every study says so. The women of S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero are also laughably incapable of making their own decisions without a man behind them. Despite all of Malti's... Fuck! Despite all of Malti's machinations and scheming behind the scenes, at the end of the day, she was only really used as a pawn for the Pope and the evil Three Heroes Church. When, in episode 21, the queen sentences her daughter and husband to death for acting in favor of the Three Heroes Church, 
and discriminating against Naofumi, it's later revealed that she was too emotional to make that decision. At the last second, she would have killed herself to atone for their sins, leaving the three heroes church and Malti free to run the country into the ground. So it's just a good thing that a man stepped in and offered the perfectly reasonable alternative of just legally changing Malti's name to Bitch Whore and being done with it. <laughs> this fucking show! <laughs> uh. In episode 22, after Naofumi's discrimination is lifted, Raftali and Philo go to get their class upgrades. Naofumi is given the option to let his parties choose freely. He selects it. But in a move of just unimaginable pettiness, the game only gives Raftali and Philo one option of a class upgrade each. The show wants you to believe in the illusion of Naofumi letting his slaves choose how to run their lives, but even on this tiny, inconsequential little point, Shield Hero can't be bothered to follow through. It is extraordinarily dedicated to making sure its viewers never see a woman act in a way now whom he doesn't have direct control over. So, we've got two types of women. We've got women who, through motherhood or being a child, or through legally sanctioned servitude, willingly give up their autonomy to men. These are good types of women. The ones who turn out to be helpful. They're the ones you can maybe start fantasizing about fucking if that's what you're after, even if they're underage. And then we have the other type, the loose cannons, unwilling to submit themselves to men. Their primitive nature takes over, turning them into compulsive liars and cheats. These are the women who have done wrong by you. This is Veronica, who went to prom with Chad instead of you. This is Stacy, who made fun of your height in 8th grade. A catch-all for any woman who doesn't quite know her place. Perhaps Shield Hero shows more examples of the first type than the second, but the second drives the plot of the entire show. Malti is easily a more ubiquitous presence in the show than any of Shield Hero's other women combined. She's the reason Naofumi can't trust anyone. Naofumi refuses to engage with women that don't pass the above. From episode 1 to 21, Malti is the source of every last one of Naofumi's problems. Ooh, that's not sexist. She really is all those things. She deserves it, so it's okay, said the writer, fully responsible for writing a female character who would, quote, deserve, unquote, such a thing in the first place, as well as fully responsible for defining the words deserve and it in this case. Literally one episode later, after we're told Malti will never be seen from again, we see her again. She tries to poison Naofumi's food, Everyone goes around the table calling her bitch and whore, even Malti's own mother. Malti doesn't even get speaking lines, she just exists so the other characters can call her names. It's a scene that does little more than offer a situation where it's acceptable to call a woman you don't like a whore and a bitch. The ultimate revelation about Malti is that she can't control who she is. She's born with, and I quote, attitude problems and a bitchy personality. She lies impulsively even when it doesn't benefit her. Women, Shield Hero says, are forced to take advantage of you even if they look like they really like you on the outside. That's just how they are, it says. It's basic biology, it says. The reason why Malti is alone in her negative characterization is precisely because of what she represents. The show invents the sphere of young woman its young straight male audience would be attracted to. Shield Hero builds a world that's filled with dangerous, unapproachable women that simultaneously withhold intimacy, attention, and or validation you need to be healthy. Shield Hero sells you a solution to the problem they invented. Real women don't love you, but your waifu sure will. Here's a world filled with cute kids, hot moms, and good, obedient little girls who now for me, you, control. And by sell you a solution, I really mean sell. The anime is something being sold to you and the Crunchyroll subscription and the menu of the Shield Hero spinoff, ugh, and the body pillows and the figurines and on and on and on and on and on until your room starts to look like some sort of other world. It's amazing how convenient things are these days. All you have to do is go to a convenience store and you can get food, drinks, cosmetics, cell phones, almost anything you want. 
except relationships because they don't sell relationships. In episode 4 of Welcome to the NHK, Hikikomori Sato and his otaku friend Yamazaki have committed to making a game together. They decide to make a hentai porn visual novel game, referring to it by the otaku euphemism Gal Game. Yamazaki convinces Sato that Gal Games are a gateway to financial success. Otaku like him buy them like crazy, so, by Yamazaki's thinking, they ought to be easy money. Once they get noticed by bigger firms, Yamazaki and Sato's company will expand ceaselessly until their games break into the American market and they have a massive skyscraper in the center of Tokyo. It's the American dream! No, it's the Japanese dream. Despite being a hikikomori, Sato doesn't know much about video games, tropes, or otaku culture. Keep this in mind. Unlike full alleles, this is important. Because Sato dropped out of school, he has no technical skills that would help with building a game. Sato is therefore put in charge of coming up with ideas for characters and writing the script, while Yamazaki handles programming, music, and art. The show makes it clear that the pair is making a game for the money. On the surface. However, Sato can't help but treat his writing like art, an expression of himself, and as a tool to help him improve. In episode 5, he remarks, even if I seclude myself in my room, as long as I'm striving to accomplish something, I'm not a hikikomori. One problem Sato quickly runs up against is that his inexperience with women makes it hard to write them realistically. He tries, but with only his mother and Mizaki, who he's only known for a few weeks at this point, to fall back on, he easily realizes that what he's writing on the page aren't women but the conception of women he's built after all these years of social alienation and isolation. That's perhaps not exactly what he says, but that's what's going on. When Sato brings a problem to his partner, Yamazaki scoffs. He says, Real life girls are nothing but trash. That's why it's essential girls in gal games aren't realistic. Their only purpose is to fulfill the player's every desire. They approach you with only kind intentions, and then they innocently fall in love with you for no apparent reason. They have no ulterior motives, and they won't betray you no matter what. Therefore, it is our sacred duty as gal game creators to design female characters that could not possibly exist in the real world. Yamazaki remarks that gal games tend to follow specific patterns, tropes, if you will. There's a childhood best friend who's perfect for you in every way. Maids, who are special because, quote, their occupation as master-slave relationship between them and the main character, unquote, which makes her perfect for you in every way. And robots, who have no autonomy, making her perfect for you in every single way. Remember when I said this anime wrote my damn essay? I was not kidding, in case it wasn't clear. It can't be overemphasized. So, Sato still doesn't get it. He needs to be taught the otaku way of viewing women, so Yamazaki shows him. He takes him to Akihabara, which he calls the Holy Land. They buy a ton of otaku merch, admitting to themselves that they spent money that was supposed to go for essentials like food or rent on merch. Everything is sexualized. The body pillars are lewd. The comic stores are riddled with magazines of female characters from kid-friendly shows and softcore porn and the figurines come explicitly with handcrafted tiny panties. Sato finds a figurine of his waifu from a gal game he's played and buys it. Yamazaki tells him there's one rule of the Holy Land. If you see something, you buy it. Listen to me, Sato. I think you're forgetting the most important part of being a gal game creator. You have to understand the feelings of the player. You must behave as they would. You don't want to make your waifu cry, do you? Yamazaki takes Sato to a maid cafe, calling it the pride of modern Japanese culture. He tells Sato, You ask yourself, what does it take to make a good gal game? Naturally, the answer is passion. No masterpiece is created without passion. Lately, everyone is just trying to cash in on popular trends. Most games you see today are nothing but cheap copies of other titles. It's sickening, really. You must always respect the player's feelings. You'll never reach the top by buying into some ridiculous fad. Here's the deal. We must create a game that appeals to the masses, but also pushes the creative envelope and turns the market completely on its head. Hey, hey, hey. It's consumer obsession again. 
How's it been? That's wonderful. Oh, me? Just slowly dying. Thanks for asking. And so, after a day of his immersion course in otaku culture, Satsu finally feels inspired to write. Something new, something big is about to be born. He starts firing off ideas for her game's main love interest left and right, while Yamazaki draws exactly what he describes. I've got it! I think I finally have an idea for the heroine of our game! Seriously? She's your classmate and childhood friend who also happens to live next door. She's also a robot, but not just any robot, a May robot! <laughs> Sato... You... 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 Huh? are a genius! That's like Mega Moe! I can feel the creative energy! I have to draw her up right now! Wait, there's plenty more where that came from. In her previous life, she and the main character were lovers! Yes, you've awakened your inner Moe! She's also really sick, so the main character has to take care of her! This is incredible! Oh. Then she jumps in front of a car to protect him and ends up in the hospital for a whole year! That's beautiful! But she's actually a ghost! More! More! And she's an alien, too! Brilliant! Then you find out that she's the reincarnation of a fox from space with a split personality! Whoa! At the end of the afternoon, Yamazaki finishes his drawing, and in a strange twist of fate, it looks exactly like Raftalia. Like, comically so. At least in Welcome to the NHK, Sato has the sense to realize that that's just way too many Moe tropes shoved into one character. They end up scrapping the design altogether. Am I saying Welcome to the NHK predicted Shield Hero? Absolutely not. Am I saying that Welcome to the NHK's criticisms of otaku culture are well-informed, and that the show has a mind-blowing mastery over the tropes, cliches, and biases that made Shield Hero, and every other incel ego trip anime like it, possible? Absolutely. There's so much more I could talk about when it comes to Welcome to the NHK. I want to talk about how Yamazaki is a verbally abusive friend who constantly makes sac Sato sacrifices art for decisions that Yamazaki thinks will net them more money, I want to talk about Zaki and how her approach to rehabilitative therapy is just reading a chapter from Freud and Jung every night to Sato while saying stuff like, If you don't have self-confidence, just pretend the person you're talking to is an even worse person than you are. With this method, I'm able to talk to you with confidence, or at the very least, a sense of superiority. I want to talk about how Welcome to the NHK argues that under capitalism, equality cannot even exist in friendship. In order for people to survive, they need friends that they can take advantage of to improve their own crappy situations. I'd love to, but I don't have the time to do any of that justice. The written version of this was an hour long, and this looks like it's going over an hour and a half. But what I can do is bring all these together into a single perfect point. Don't worry, it's not that hard. Since the show has thematic resonance, it does the work for me. In the show's second to last episode, Misaki declares that Sato has passed her rehabilitation program and is officially not a Hikikimori. When Sato asks why he was chosen for her program in the first place, Misaki says that she found the perfect candidate, someone even more worthless than her. Now that her first program was a success, Misaki offers Sato a contract for the second program. The contract reads, Sato, known as Party A, and Misaki, known as Party B, hereby agree to the following terms. 1. Party A will not grow to dislike Party B. 2. Party A will grow to like Party B. 3. He won't have a change of heart along the way. 4. He won't change his feelings in the future. 5. He'll always be by her side when she's lonely. 6. That being said, since Party B is always lonely, Party A will always be by your side. 7. If he does this, life will probably proceed in a good direction. 8. I think the suffering will go away. 9. But if he breaks the contract, the fine is 10 million yen. Misaki says that because she's worked hard, and she's done everything she can to please Sato, and because she's been completely devoted to him, Sato should, by now, be absolutely crazy for her. In this scene, Misaki is Raftalia. She willingly entered a contract where she serves someone she was smitten with because she's independent on the other person for her sense of self. Raftalia needs Naofumi's validation to survive, like Misaki needs Sato's. 
Obviously, in the first case, Naofumi forced a contract onto her and made her dependent, whereas here, Misaki approaches Sato and came with her own issues. Yet the, the nuts and bolts of the situation are the same. Both Raftalia and Misaki offer to renew their contracts. Shield hero, Naofumi agrees. Raftalia becomes a slave after she's freed in episode 4, and things proceed in a good direction. Welcome to the NHK does not pretend that this is acceptable or okay. Sato says no, not because he doesn't like Misaki, or that he isn't appreciative of what he's done for him, but because deep down, he knows it's fake. I can't do this. Uh, but why not? I mean, now that your friends are gone, I'm the only person you have left. You have to sign this, Sato. If you don't, then you'll be alone forever. I can't! This kind of thing is just empty. Don't turn your back on me! If you don't sign this, then I'll... I'll fall to pieces! You'll be fine! <sighs> You'll be fine, Misaki. Don't worry. Just do some yoga exercises or something to clear your head. Then maybe you'll stop coming up with these stupid ideas. I'm telling you, a cute girl like you can have a great life without someone like me. Look up when you walk, okay? Wait! Are you lonely? No! I'm not! I can't take this! I'm falling apart! I don't want to be lonely! Leave me alone! I'm not lonely, alright? I don't believe you! <laughs> Raftalia and Misaki have similar breakdowns in the face of person, the man that they need, leaving them. In Welcome to the NHK, the unsustainable, unhealthy relationship between the two main leads falls apart. Misaki attempts suicide. It's revealed to us that Misaki was abandoned by her father, her mother committed suicide, and her stepfather abused her until she was a young adult. In her mind, Sato is her only source of validation. Now that Sato is no longer Hikikomori, and no longer in need of her help, all she can hear is the voice of her stepfather telling her she's useless, telling her that everything bad that's ever happened is her own fault. If all of this is true, Misaki decides she can't afford to live. Sato arrives in time to stop her. He argues that the weight of everything wrong in the world, and even everything wrong in our own lives, is too much for one person to bear. Instead, he tells Misaki about the NHK. He tells her that her suffering isn't her own fault, that there's a larger system at play making her and him and everyone they know miserable. Sato offers to kill himself in Misaki's place. He wants to sacrifice himself to slow down the NHK, so that Misaki can keep living. In his mind, she deserves to, not him. Fortunately, his attempt fails. The spot Misaki chose was a popular suicide destination, so they... They built a net at the base to catch the jumpers. The two of them return from the cliff friends. Real friends. They have a new contract, one where they support each other equally under threat of mutually assured destruction. Sato has a job now. He can leave his apartment, and he helps Misaki, who had to drop out of high school due to her abuse, prepare for college. Above all, Sato teaches Misaki about the NHK. She teaches her that when bad things happen in her life, she should remember those forces are part of a conspiracy. So, what is the NHK? I mean, it's capitalism. Duh, of course that would be my answer, but I'd be hard-pressed to find an answer that fits the themes of the show better than that. With the understanding that the shadowy conspiracy behind it all is really just a socioeconomic system that has no problem alienating and isolating ordinary people so that a few people can hoard all the benefit, a lot of these other things that I said I wish I could talk about more just kind of fall into place. I told you Sato gets a job. The only reason Sato has a job is because with his parents broke, he was driven to starvation and coerced into finding one. The only reason why his parents couldn't find new jobs despite years of work experience is the failure of capitalism as a socioeconomic system. The only reason why Sato was driven to be a hikikomori was because of how the NHK capitalism corroded the nature of the relationships around him. 
It's not the only reason why Misaki's stepfather was abusive, obviously. But it is said that one thing that soured the relationship between Misaki's mother and her new husband was that the husband couldn't hold a job. Without economic power, Misaki's mother couldn't leave her husband either, and thus neither could her child, who the stepfather honestly didn't care about anyway. On Yamazaki's side, his capitalist tendencies fuel otaku consumption. Yamazaki was bullied and rejected by women. But corporate otaku culture turns that pain into a generalized hatred for women and other people, a hatred that he passes on to others through otaku culture and, you know, just regular verbal abuse. At the end of the show, Yamazaki and Sato's game makes no money. Despite the fact that it's helped Sato improve more than Misaki's therapy ever did, and despite his writing, when uncorrupted by Yamazaki's influence, being original and interesting to other characters on the show, Sato sees the lack of revenue from the game as a sign that he's obviously an artistic failure and gives up writing for good. It's a capitalist mindset that ruins his prospects as an artist. When Megami Kobayashi tells Sato to join the winning team, she's talking about switching sides from the proletariat to the bourgeoisie, because the only way to avoid oppression is to become the oppressor, in her mind anyway. Plus, there's like a line in the show where it said the NHK is responsible for global warming. So, when Sato tells Misaki not to let herself take the blame for what is obviously the doing of a worldwide conspiracy, he tells her not to take the blame for the unjust hierarchies that exist around her and make her suffer. Obviously, we all have personal room for improvement, but we shouldn't take on so much guilt for our pain that it drives us to our graves, especially when there's something else at work alongside our own actions. Part 6 Recuperation, aka how so many are missing the point. There's going to be someone somewhere who tells me that I'm reading into these shows. Shield Hero is just some isekai that doesn't deserve any attention. Welcome to the NHK is good, but it's not supposed to be serious. If there's one thing that's frustrated me about the anime fandom since I joined, it's the stubbornness to take any anime beyond its face value. Like, anime fans have the reputation for being some of the most inquisitive fans in any medium, and I guess it's true if we're talking about finding plot holes or animation errors. It sure is good for capital that we're unable to criticize the world through art under the fear of politicizing anime. Another conspiracy, perhaps? Well, maybe, but there's more to it, as always. There were a lot of people who wanted Sato to say yes to Misaki's new contract. They wanted her to dedicate herself to him, and for him to love her for it, and for them to have lots and lots of sex. There were a lot of people who were disappointed that that's not what happened. The overlap between those fans and fans who like S.H.I.E.L.D. heroes is probably stunning. Like the NHK, criticism is something that's invisible for those who refuse to see it. Self-reflection is hard and scary. Why well, think about how fucked up the world is, and how unhealthy I am, and how a better life is possible for me, but it's trapped behind things I'm too afraid to do or experience. Why go through all that? I can just sit back, kick my feet up, and watch another episode of The Rising of the Shield Hero. I can feel safe and validated. I can think about how cute the girls are, and while I'm at it, I might buy some merch and a Crunchyroll subscription. The thing about the conspiracy of capitalism is that there's no hidden puppet masters. It's a, it's a system designed by no one person but unimaginably effective at coercing people to act in ways that perpetuate capitalism. Because at the end of the day, everyone needs a paycheck. And so there's only so long you can spend being upset at the world before it burns you out and you fall back in line. And I thought about how to reword it to sound more authentic. I thought about how even 14,000 words in, more or less, I could ever make my own experiences stick the landing. I thought, and I thought, and I thought, and I just... I don't know if I can do it. This essay is like two bread tube videos in written form. I don't need to add Oliver Thorne's The Cosmonaut on top of that. Baby steps. I think a lot about why I care so much about S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero, though. Why, after all this time, I let myself get obsessed with it. Why I watched the show as many times as I did, despite it giving me severe mood swings and bouts of anger and depression. I write books. <laughs> I write fiction. I write, I write things that make me happy. Yet, the single piece that, until now, I put the most effort to, it's this. 
It's this fucking thing. I think about how I've hurt others. I think about the otaku shut-ins with no sense of self-esteem, few friends, and no luck in relationships. I think about how they just can't help but objectify and alienate the woman they want to make happy. How much I've aligned with that stereotype in the not-so-recent past. Maybe this essay is a warning. To the anime fans who are where I was, about to step into a trap created by people who neither love you or care about you, selling you something that isn't going to fix what's wrong. By writing about things I used to believe and say and describing how I used to act and calling out things I used to hold true as sexist and stupid and naive. In French, there's a verb, rongé. Generally, it's translated as to gnaw. And usually that's not a bad translation, but here's the thing. Tana emphasizes the persistence of the action by the subject. A mouse gnawing on cheese brings to mind the constant nibbling that mice do when they eat. But with Hongzhi, there is an added emphasis that the word gnaw doesn't really have in English. It's that whatever is being gnawed at deteriorates, little by little, piece by piece. The word is focused on what's being torn apart. The culture, the thought patterns that anime like Shield Hero help create nod at me. Tout ça me rangé. Maybe I was always insecure and self-loathing, but it's not like anime helped. It's not like Reddit helped. If I complain that Shield Hero is sexist, it's not only because the show's messaging is harmful to women in the anime community and elsewhere. I mean, this is definitely true, and it's part of the reason why this essay is important to me, but I'm not a woman. And I'm learning to accept the fact that a female author could have handled this aspect of the essay far better than my half-understanding of how any of this works. I complain about Shield Hero's sexism because the specific kind of sexism it's peddling is self-destructive. After there's nothing left, after all the pieces of what used to be yourself have crumbled away, after the unpaid workers producing Shield Hero's merchandise work themselves to an early death, the only thing that'll be left is some billionaire somewhere looking down at the rubble. Part 8. Conclusion The rising of the S.H.I.E.L.D. hero's Raftalia is the perfect waifu. While S.H.I.E.L.D. hero started out as a web novel, it had to have been found by powerful people in the light novel, manga, and anime industries. These people collectively worked as one system, as part of an evil, global organization known as the NHK. The author gave Raftalia a cute design and a bubbly personality, informed by many, many similar designs cooked up by executives. They knew what someone like me needed in my life was someone who loves me for who I am. The NHK knew what I needed in my life was someone who stands up for me when even I don't want to. The NHK knew what I needed in my life was someone who defends me against a society that wants nothing more than to see me suffer. The NHK knew I needed someone cute, someone who would never leave me or even risk wanting to leave me. They knew because they worked to make me that way. That's how they, the system, made Raftalia perfect. <laughs> Part 9. Epilogue. If you found any of the discussion here useful, please sign up for my Patreon. My ego buff mostly comes from the view-read ratio I get on Medium, not for money. However, it would help make working what I should be studying worthwhile. I'd like to thank my buddy Raghava slash Brannis Angel for reading this essay not once, but twice. They also pretty much wrote the introduction for this piece too, and provided a ton of helpful feedback, citations, extra materials, and more. They looked out for me when I was kind of driving myself insane with this stuff. I couldn't ask for a better friend. I owe him a ton. If you'd like to read the last treatise I did, um, you can click in the description. It's about kill a kill on fascism. It's, it's a fun time. If you're listening on the audio version and you like what you hear, also consider donating to my Patreon. I could invest in some better equipment. Plus there are some cool tier prizes on there, so be sure to check it out.
Up next on Mo's Home for Treatises and Hot Takes, I'm cooking up a Steven Universe movie hot take right now, and there's a Fire Force treatise in the works. As for Mo Black on Medium in general, I've got more fiction and writing advice, of course, and a web novel? Huh? Well, sort of. You'll have to stick around to find out. See ya! In the end, even after all we went through, none of our problems were solved. And even though things look better now, it wouldn't surprise me if we went back to saying things like I'm useless so I can't do it. Still, for now at least, I'm hanging in there. I don't know how long it'll last, but damn it, I'll give it the best I've got. <laughs>